Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Baker Bookhouse. Uh, my name is Christopher. I am the academic and Bible buyer here at Baker, and I'm uh, very excited to be here tonight with uh, Gavin Ortland. He's going to be uh, discussing his new book, uh, Why God Makes Sense in a World That Doesn't. And um, so I'm just going to uh, turn it to you, Gavin, just uh, introduce yourself, uh, give us a little bit about uh, who you are, what you do, what your background is, and uh, what led you to, uh, to write this book. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I'm excited to talk about it. Um, yeah, I'm a pastor in Ojai, California, which is about 80 miles northwest of LA, and I'm married with four kids. And my academic background is in historical theology. I'm also really interested in apologetics, and that's uh, what really led to this book. Um, I do a, a YouTube channel called Truth Unites that addresses apologetics issues, ecumenical theology, dialogue, and various other things. Um, we mentioned I've got the book here. I got my first copy about a week ago, which was a lot of fun to get a copy of it. So um, yeah, the book came out of, I would say, two things. One is just a genuine burden for people who are struggling with their faith right now. Um, when I think about the intended audience, I think about three people. One would be uh, skeptics who are at least open to considering the claims of Christianity. The second would be Christians who are struggling and wondering if they can or want to continue in, in faith. And then the third would just be Christians who want to learn more how to help people who would be in one of those categories. So I just feel that there's so much of that right now. There's so much disintegration. There's There are so many people I know who are struggling with despair, who are facing realities that are making them ask deep questions and kind of question their framework and kind of wonder like the things that I've believed, can I really still believe them. I think there's probably a lot of different causes to that, but there's so many scandals that have occurred in the church. The The political and social turmoil of our culture uh, affects us all. So I just have a burden to help people, you know, let's go back. A lot of what I aspire to in my ministry on YouTube and elsewhere in my writing is trying to be a positive voice, trying to be a voice of reconstruction, trying to help people rebuild. You know, I think those times of deconstruction and reconstruction can be really healthy. Francis Schaeffer went through that as a seasoned pastor. He went back and reworked through things. And so the, argument, the, the book is talking about, let's go back to these two things, the existence of God, the resurrection of Jesus. Those are not to be assumed right now. Those are a great starting point for people who are kind of rethinking uh, what it's all about. What are we all doing here in this world? So that's, that's the main burden. I would also just say my, out of my own personal life, I've been through two seasons of not deep doubt, but kind of wrestling with anxiety about my faith. And I know what that feels like. And I'm also personally just really curious about um, the arguments and the content of the book. I, I watch YouTube debates uh, uh, on the existence of God. I, I find all that just fascinating. I think there's nothing more fun to think about than God. Um, nothing more enjoyable. He's the most interesting idea, as well as the, act, the most interesting person. And so these arguments are just endlessly fascinating. So that's a little bit of where it came from. That's awesome. Yeah. On that theme of enjoyment, um, one of the things that stood out about your book in comparison to other books on apologetics is your, your emphasis on, on enjoyment, on beauty. Um, you write that you want your, your readers to be captivated and delighted uh, by the subject matter. And that's, that, that stood out because a lot of times when we think of apologetics, we think of uh, arguments to convince the mind uh, that something is true, but you, you've you taken somewhat of a different approach here. Um, uh, talk about that for a minute. Yeah, well, I, I think that apologetics, like all other expressions of communicating the gospel, must take into account our audience. Who is it that we're talking to? And um, we're, we're not talking to robots, you know? <laughs> we're, we're talking to human beings, and logic and argumentation is actually a, just a small piece of the pie for what makes people actually change their mind in real life. It's important, and I do not want to downplay the importance of argumentation um, and considerations of truth, 
But there's so much else that goes into how we view the world and how we make large scale changes and how we view the world. So I think as a matter of strategy, uh, right now, especially um, showing that the gospel is good news and helping people feel that as well as see that, I think that that is especially important. I would also say that is a classical Christian approach. One of my convictions is apologetics shouldn't be divorced from the rest of theology. And um, the, the typical way to do it has been the good, the true, the beautiful, all three. They're interrelated. And you only see any one of those when you see it in relation to the other two. And so that's a, a little bit of what is on my mind with this as well. And I have just seen that work in my own life. I mean, I've had so many people who've become a Christian because they read the Lord of the Rings. Mm. And you'd say, well, why would that make you? It's just a work of fiction. It's not an argument. But there's an, an enchantment and a beauty and a glory that is conveyed through the story that um, is hard to account for, from my vantage point, from a nihilistic worldview. So I, I think that appeal really works at, at a street level. Yeah. You mentioned toward the, the beginning of your book that toward the beginning of this project, you picked up some of the books from the New Atheists, uh, Richard Dawkins, Sam uh, Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens and, and just uh, digested some of their work uh, in preparation to, to writing this book. Um, how, how, did, how did that inspire you to, uh, to take this approach? I mean, uh, I remember in my reading of Dawkins, I, I was personally struck by how, how uninspiring his, mm. his worldview is and, and what he was trying to, to sell me on. It was just to me, it was, it was bland, but did you, what was it somewhat in response to that, that blandness of their, uh, of the, the naturalistic worldview that wanted you to, um, I guess, in a sense, tell a better story? Yes, but the way it played out for me was really interesting because one of the things that's important to me is to try to genuinely understand another perspective without caricaturing it. And I think about that a lot in my ecumenical work, but also across a, a religious divide from a, I'm a, as a Christian pastor reading, you know, I'll never forget being at the bookstore. I got all three of those books and started reading them and trying to genuinely understand from their perspective, how the world makes sense to them. Cause I think that's so important that we don't, you know, we, we see the world through someone else's eyes, like Atticus Finch talks about in the, in the story to kill a mockingbird, which is such a, such an important thing. So in the context of that, I mean, I think what I saw with the kind of the new atheist strand, which is, that's just one strand of kind of a, an atheistic or agnostic uh, stream, you know, that, that in some respects, it's kind of the more fundamentalist strand of that whole stream. There's lots of atheists and agnostics who are more cautious and less black and white than it, from my vantage point, someone like Richard Dawkins. But what, one of the things I noticed is how different that kind of atheism is from kind of the more classical atheism that I think of with like some of the great philosophers in, in history, like Nietzsche, for example, or more recently, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, the existentialist. And so one of the things I do in the book is I contrast the new atheists and the old atheists, as I call them. And I try to point out that the, you know, the old atheists had a kind of honesty because they're noticing when without God, they have this sense of devastation. You know, we have to reinvent moral values. There's this massive loss. And there's passages in Nietzsche where he's making it sound like the lights to the universe have gone out. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no turning back. It's utter devastation. And you compare that with someone like Sam Harris, for example, who I, I go through his book, The Moral Landscape, and he's talking about how He's describing the good life as having all these kind of humanitarian values where you're, you know, donating your money to found orphanages and helping children across the world and so on and so forth. And he, he values reason, he values science, and uh, he doesn't have that same sense of devastation in the same way. And so one of the things that I try to get into in the book is to really press that point and say, hold on, Sam Harris, do you have a, do you have a basis for the good values you're affirming that I share with you. But, but what's the foundation for that? Where does that come from in your worldview? And I make the argument that the older atheists were more consistent 
And so um, it it is, to your question, it is a, a way of com comparing these two stories, um, a Christian story, a naturalistic story. And I am trying to say, these are very different. They're different. I, I think the Christian story is more plausible, and I'm arguing for that. But I'm also trying to say it's just a better story. You know, it's more enchanting. It's more dignifying. It's more elegant. So I'm trying to draw attention to all of that. Great. Um, I want to mention to our, uh, our audience, too, if you have any questions uh, for Gavin, feel free to leave those in the chat. Um, we're also uh, giving you the link to order uh, Gavin's book through our website. Um, if you follow that link, you can get it for 40% off and free shipping. Um, I do have a question from uh, somebody gave us. Um, they're wondering, Gavin, do you, uh, has Herman Bovink had any influence on your approach? I love Herman Bovink. I've spent a lot of time engaging him. Um, I can't say that I've spent enough time with him that he's like a major influence, but I would say for someone who is extremely theologically sophisticated and yet also very engaged on social issues and not and very um, generous in his posture to other Christians. I do th see those qualities in his writing and I do uh, admire them and, and try to follow after them. Yes, uh, it was clear from reading your book that someone who has had an impact on you is Blaise Pascal. Um, you, you reference him a lot, especially his, uh, strategy for commending God to unbelievers. Um, you want to talk a little bit about the strategy that he uses and, and what of that, uh, influenced, um, your strategy for, uh, for giving, uh, commendation or an argument for God. Yes. I, I, I love Blaise Pascal. I, I reread through uh, some of his what are called pensées or thoughts that uh, Peter Kreeft has a great edition of those where he has a number of them. And I don't think it's complete. And then he gives commentary and it's, it's really a great uh, read. Um, and he's the greatest influence on the book. I started and finished the book with him. Mm -hmm. To start the book, I mentioned one little of his thoughts that really informs the whole approach where he says, people, are, people hate religion and are afraid it might be true. So the response to that is a threefold strategy where he says, first, make uh, religion respectable, second, make it desirable, and third, show that it is true. And it just seems to me that many efforts at apologetics start at level three. They're just trying to say, here's why it's true. And they don't have the psychological wisdom and sort of shrewdness of Pascal, where he's saying, if you really want to convince someone, you can't just throw logical arguments at them. You know, you have to kind of work with where they're coming from. And so my book is really focused on the second stage there, showing the goodness, um, you know, for, for people who don't even think it's respectable. I agree with Pascal. You have to start even back at that point. If, mm -hmm. if someone doesn't even think it's worth having the conversation, books like Tim Keller's book, Making Sense of God, are great for starting at that point, um, if they're willing to read a book like that. Um, the second stage is where I'm really interested in. Now, these are not absolutely in contrast with each other. So it's, they all flow together. But I'm trying to show that if you transition from a naturalistic worldview to believing in the resurrection of Jesus, the feeling that comes with that couldn't be more happy and of greater relief. It's like the, the things I compare to in the book are waking up on Christmas morning as a child and realizing, oh, it's Christmas today. Mm -hmm or uh, when you're pursuing your spouse and the first time you ever realized, wow, they love me too. Those are the emotions of stepping into the gospel and thinking, wow, Jesus actually rose from the dead. And I'm trying to, to chase down those implications and help people feel the weight of that. Not that that's all that needs to be done in apologetics, but I think it's an important step. Yeah. Um, we said uh, someone asked about the... Um the argument for God from mathematics. Um, this was something, this, this is something uh, reading your book that I found uh, fascinating. I, I remember, so, so when I was in, uh, um, when I was in junior high and high school, math was my best subject. And uh, after algebra two class, I, I'd sometimes hang out after class and, and chat with the, the teacher and kind of mess around on the, on the whiteboard. 
And um, I remember distinctly one day I was, um, it was actually, it was Pascal's triangle that I was uh, kind of, kind of playing around with. And suddenly it, it hit me that each tier of, of this triangle, which, uh, which, which up until then, I just assumed this was just this thing that was there. It didn't really, you know, I, I, I couldn't detect that it had any use, but I, I realized that each tier corresponded with uh, the coefficients to binomial expansion that we've just been talking about in class. And I was like, this, this thing that just exists um, has this this practical use. And, and, and I was just, I was just struck by that. And, and you, you talk a little bit about, um, that the usefulness of mathematics and the beauty uh, of mathematics in your book and um and how it's, it's difficult to explain those things from a naturalistic perspective so maybe, maybe uh talk a little bit more about that what what is briefly what is the argument for god from mathematics okay this is my favorite part uh, <laughs> i i'll uh, it was so i didn't expect to be sympathetic to this argument at all and I was shocked to discover this is there's something to this. Now I leverage this as an what's called an abductive argument, which simply means an inference to the best explanation. So it's not an ironclad argument. I'm not saying this proves God. I'm saying uh, theism of some variety, or even there could be other alternatives, some other kind of what I could call supernaturalism. So just the belief there's something beyond nature, beyond physical nature, is a better explanatory framework than naturalism for math. So just to clarify, I'm not, that's, it's a modest argument, but uh, I draw attention to three features of math. It's permanence, it's beauty, and it's usefulness. And I say, naturalism is much, is, is a much inferior way to explain those things. Taking permanence, for example, most of us have the intuition that mathematical truths are what a philosopher would call necessary truths. They're true in every possible world. So way to think of it, if our entire universe collapsed into non-being, there's nothing left, would it still be the case that two plus three equals five? Mm. Most of us would say, well, yeah, it doesn't depend upon physical reality that two plus three equals five. What else is it going to equal, you know? And it equals exactly five. It doesn't equal 5.001 or 4.9998. It equals exactly five. And so you say this this seemingly permanent, binding, and exact truth. Where does something like that come from? Um, it, it's an odd fit in a naturalistic worldview because there is nothing sort of immaterial and permanent like that. And so you'd say, well, where does that come from? And then I, I say more about the beauty and usefulness, just the, the usefulness is the, this is the most common way this argument is leveraged, where basically it just seems like an extraordinary coincidence that math maps on to the to our physical universe so exactly. So, uh, boy, that was the funnest part to write. I hope people enjoyed reading it. It was fun to read these professional mathematicians describe just what you mentioned, their experience of math and the sense of exciting discovery, the sense of you're discovering this truth that's out there. And they talk about, they use metaphors like opening a door into a new world or opening a book and reading the pages. There's this truth this invisible truth called math out there. And uh, when you think about it, it really is a strange companion to a naturalistic worldview. Yeah, no, that, that was really, really fun to read. Um, uh, yeah, that just when, when you have a moment like that where, where something just suddenly strikes you, I mean, that's that's something that, that sticks with you. Um, uh, one of the things you... So you, you mentioned beauty uh, with regard to math, and, and beauty is a theme that comes up throughout the book. Um, someone from the audience is um, uh, they, they've watched your YouTube videos, and you said your your argument from beauty was so powerful in those videos, and they want to know why isn't the argument from beauty a more popular argument uh, among uh, apologists? Mm. That's a great question. I don't know the answer, but I wonder if maybe part of the reason is apologists feel more pressure to give ironclad certain deductive arguments. Some, not all, but sometimes apologists feel this pressure. Like I've got to, I've got to wow the audience with this kind of like, here's how 
improbable the alternative is and kind of a slam dunk argument. And the argument from beauty, various arguments that can be given that appeal to beauty, they work differently. They're not quite so confident. Um, they're a bit more subtle. They sneak up on you a bit more. But that doesn't mean they're necessarily less persuasive for people in the real world. So maybe that's part of the reason is we feel an undue pressure for certainty. Hmm. The um, yeah, the the idea that uh, I I think what you're describing it like um, you talk a lot about narrative and story in your book too, which is a that's a much slower way to to make a point than to just hit somebody with an ironclad rational argument. But uh, but you argue that it's it's often a, a far more persuasive way to make a point um talk about um talk a little bit about the, the power of storytelling and um and why that can be such an effective way to uh, uh to convey truth mm -hmm. stories are so powerful I, I would go so far as to say that stories are simply how human beings make sense of ultimate questions think about the role of movies in our culture so what someone once said there have been societies that don't have the wheel but there have never been societies that don't have stories and in our society movies are one very powerful mechanism for storytelling you can tell people are searching out ultimate questions through stories i so the whole idea of my book is i'm framing four of the classical theistic proofs as parts of a story. So I'm, you know, my four chapters, I've got the first argument is the argument for God as the first cause. So that's the author of the story. The second chapter is the argument from design. That's the meaning of the story. Third chapter is the moral argument. That's the drama or conflict of the story, because every story has good conflict. And the fourth argument is the, or fourth chapter is the the argument from Jesus, that's the hope of the story. So I'm though the book is casting theistic proofs in a narrative frame. And there's so much that's powerful about that. One thing is I think it's better positioned to address the problem of evil, which is the great challenge we face. Mm -hmm. I think that's the greatest objection to, to faith. And I think in some respects, story provides a more satisfying way of engaging with that particular challenge. So I, I'm sure we might get into that more later too. Uh, got a question from someone here. I said, how would you try to attract someone who's not a believer to read your book and follow your, apo your apologetic argument when you know they would be interested in the concepts but may not know or admit they're attracted to the argument? I can see the, uh, in my chat box here, this is from Mark Bodycomb, who's one of my friends I play soccer with. So, hey, Mark, <laughs> great to get a question from you. Um, yeah, this is the great, this is part of that Pascalian strategy that I mentioned of don't just show it's true, make show that it's meaningful, desirable. So like in his example, here's one thing I like to do is every person we talk to is made in God's image. And therefore, every person we will have some common ground with, and there'll be some values we share. So right now, for example, many people care about issues of justice. Uh, many people care about uh, a aesthetic and artistic beauty. Um, many people care about um, how we can leave a better world for our children. You know, th there are points of common ground we can start with, and then we can ask the question, what worldview makes the most sense of these desires and provides the framework in which we can best live out our values with respect to them, to take the issue of justice, for example, and I get into this in the third chapter in the moral argument, there's not much hope in a naturalistic worldview for justice. Justice, our, law, our sense of justice is a part of the evolutionary process. That's it. It's in us because it helped animals survive, period. Nothing more than that. There's no transcendent hope for justice. Now, if you really think about that, that is devastating. That shows why Sartre and Nietzsche and the old atheists were so burdened, you know, because no one can live with that hope. We all deeply sense in our hearts that there's more to it than that. So I find it a helpful strategy to try to draw people in to 
um, offer the gospel as good news. For many people, the gospel will be good news, not, not only because it provides forgiveness of sins and eternal life with God, but also because it provides just sanity, <laughs> a framework for making sense of the longings of the human heart and how to order society. I don't want to assume that people in our culture have those things. A lot of people feel very lost and very much in the dark. And the gospel speaks to that. It speaks to our darkness and our sense of lostness. So I, you know, there's also sin and opposition to God. We have to counter factor that in. I don't want to be overly optimistic, but in terms of how we make an appeal to people, I think drawing attention to the way the gospel speaks to those deep values that many of us have and those longings in the heart is a good effort we can make. What, uh, one portion of your book that, uh, that really struck me and stuck with me as well was your, um, you're talking about the brothers Karamazov, the novel by, by Dostoevsky. And, um, in particular, the perspective of one of the characters who, uh, he's kind of the, the skeptic, uh, of the, of the brothers, I Ivan is, um, one of the brothers who, uh, just just kind of has this nihilistic worldview he um but but the worldview is is shaped by the fact that he can't accept a world where uh where they're suffering particularly children who who suffer and he says even if even if somehow all of this works out in the end and there's uh, you know everything's made right still the, the fact that there's um, there's this, this needless suffering, um, of, of innocence. Uh, it, it just doesn't, I, I don't, I don't accept that. It, it, this doesn't work for me. And he, um, and his, his brother who's listening to him talk about this doesn't, doesn't give any response, but, but as the, the story goes on, it, it's, it's the events in the story that, that prove that, that is that he's wrong that or, or and i think as, as you put it like he's he's almost right <laughs> but but then but 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 not quite because there's um there is hope and and, and there is or there, there's at least explanation for why um i think you, you say that the christian worldview doesn't necessarily explain why there's pain but it explains that 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 pain is wrong and, and uh that we you know, not an explanation for evil, but it lets us know that there is evil and, and, and we ought to feel the weight of that. Um, that, that just, that really stuck with me in a, in a, in a powerful way. Um, so I was, I was right in the middle of that book when, when I read yours. And, uh, so I really appreciated that portion. Um, uh, so, so you talked about like how a, a, a good story in, in that sense, you can, can be even a more powerful argument than just, um, uh, just a rational persuasion. Um, uh, one thing I, could I, could I just speak to oh, that? Yeah. For, so yeah, what you're saying there is so interesting that yeah, Ivan is the character in the brothers Karamazov who represents atheism and his arguments are brilliant. You know, he has no answer. I'll never forget reading through just like you and just thinking, w when is Dostoevsky going to debunk uh, Ivan's arguments? And he doesn't. But uh, finally, what I came to see is the he's still not saying Ivan is right because the 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 narrative undermines because his philosophy, though it's not refuted, becomes the basis. And I don't want to give a spoiler here for the movie, but for something bad that happens. So, um, and whereas this other character, Alyosha, who has no answers, but he has sincere faith and charity for others, his, he becomes sort of the hero of the story. And it is something worth reflecting upon. I don't want to push this too far. Though philosophers who give responses to the problem of evil, that's good. There's a need for those. But I often find that it's good to be cautious in the way we apply those to people, because the problem of evil is a real problem. And yeah, what you said is well characterizing what I was trying to get at in the book where I was saying um, the problem of evil is a problem. Like it's a problem for all of us. It's both globally and locally a problem. It's a problem philosophically. It's a problem emotionally and personally. That's not to say it has no answer, 
but it is a problem. But atheism doesn't even allow you to see it as a problem. You can say it's inconvenient or I don't like it, but you can't really be furious with evil because there's no standard to compare it to. At least theism gives you this much. You can be mad. <laughs> you yeah. can say this is bad. Like this is not the way the world is supposed to be. And then ultimately, I do think there's hope for those things. But I, one of the things I really try to do in the book, and I say this briefly, and I really believe this is it's good to be guarded and careful in the way we address the problem of evil. Sometimes with some people, the best response is not really an argument. It's just a hug and, and, and being like Alyosha, silence, but love. Sometimes it depends, but it's good to be sensitive about that. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, so the subtitle of your book is The Beauty of Christian Theism. And uh, I couldn't help notice, but you don't really get to the Christian part. You, you talk about theism throughout the book, but you don't really get to the Christian part until uh, the last quarter of the book. Why, why, um, why do you take so long until you get to uh, arguing for a distinctively uh, Christian view of God? Well, like any good detective, you know, you start off with the, the broadest array of suspects, you know, you can't assume anything, but then you can narrow it down and you could get where you're 10 days into the detective case and now you've got like three suspects and it's between these three people, you know, so you start broad and then you narrow it down. I think a lot of the arguments for God don't necessarily prove just the Christian God, uh, you know, the cosmological argument, which is the argument for God is the first cause. There are people who try to say it had to be the Trinity that was that first cause. Well, I'm sympathetic to that, but I don't know that I could prove that. <laughs> um, what Psalm 19 and Romans 1 are talking about, about nature revealing God, um, I think it is revealing the Christian God, but I don't think you necessarily know that God is a Trinity just from those things. So I, I think what I'm trying to do is start broad, and I even say in the first chapter, it's not even proving God. It's just putting a foot in the door against naturalism. It's just saying, it looks like there's something. Uh, you know, we don't know if it's deism or theism yet, but it, there's something. Um, and then you're trying to hone the suspects as you go. And it's really when we get to Jesus that I think then we can confidently say, okay, this is the, this is the particular God that we are after here. I've got a question from someone here. They're asking, how impactful would this book have been if you had read it 10 years ago? Mm. That is a fascinating question. <laughs> uh, I just got to wrap my mind around that for a second. Think about myself 10 years ago. What is that, 2011? Yeah. Um, I think I would have, I hope I would have appreciated it. Um, I think that I would have, some of it would have gone over my head in the sense that some of my own particular anguish and working through things that has been characteristic of my life over the last four to five years uh, has made me more sensitive to the content. And so there's a sense in which um, I'm able to enter in a little bit more to some of the appeals in this book than because I wasn't as mature 10 years ago, <laughs> I didn't have as much of a sensitivity to the anguish of working through some things and how disillusioning you, how disillusioned you can feel. So I hope it would have helped me. I think I would have appreciated it, but I probably would have experienced it differently 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now I'm thinking what it'll be like in 10 years from now though. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I would keep thinking about that question. I know one other thing on that, though, is I do think taking it off of me personally, I do think our culture has changed in some respects. I do think that, and I don't understand all this. I'm not uh, an expert on this, but I just sense a little more despair now. And I sense among the youngest generation, I'm a millennial, people younger than me, people in like teenagers right now. I also sense a lot of more openness to irreligion, a lot of openness to, to secularism. Um, so uh, I hope that my book is well suited for the times we live in because of all the despair out there. Do you think there's something unique about our, our current context that, um, that has created a need for better storytelling? Um, or do, do you think, 
because because I know like with, with a lot of classical approaches to po apologetics, again that there's there's an engagement of the the rational. Um, and I know that there always there always have been folks you know engaging more of the, the effective uh, aspects of humans, but I don't know. Is it, do you feel like there's more of a need for uh, for more uh, appeals to the imagination and, and emotion than than there always have been, or are we just kind of now? I think so. Realizing yeah. that. Yeah, yeah I, I do think so. In the beginning of the book, I talk about three characteristics of our culture for why I think beauty is especially needed. One of them is distraction. The sheer, it's just hard to get anyone to pay attention to anything you ever say. <laughs> I mean, it is hard because of our cell phones and the pace of life. Everybody's flying from one thing to the next, you know? And, and so um, beauty has a way and story have a way of arresting our attention also the outrage, the polarization, also the disenchantment. I think one apologist said to me recently that our greatest enemy is not counter arguments. Our greatest enemy is apathy. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of people are just not thinking about ultimate questions with an earnestness. And yes, stories just have a way of drawing us in, you know, for someone, uh, I, I, there's many out there who feel this deep sense of alienation and chaos, like they're not able to piece together what this life is all about. Everything feels like it's flying apart, that those deep existentialist struggles that people like Sartre talk about, just the feeling of alien, being hurled into existence, and I don't know how to make sense of it. I don't have any sort of transcendent framework. Stories are one way we get that right? Stories are one way we can make sense of reality. And seeing the Christian story as this achingly beautiful, transcendent story is, uh, I think that's always been powerful, but it does seem especially pertinent right now. That's why I'm so passionate about this topic. I've got a question from someone here. Um, say, I thought I'd face a lot more apologetic arguments in my community, but it seems that people haven't even thought about God enough to have questions. What are some ways to get people to consider the beauty of Christianity? Mm. Yes, this question is from Daryl Dash, who's a good good guy, and I love his writing as well. Um, yes, uh, this goes back to what we just said about that our greatest enemy is apathy, not counter arguments. And I really think there's a lot to that. What I, that's partly what is driving me in this approach, because it seems to me that um, if people aren't paying attention to arguments for or against God, one of the ways that beauty and desire can come in is to help us, sh help motivate us to care in the first place. So if we can, if I can help someone really look down, so let's say there's theism here is one option, and there's naturalism here is another. I know there's, those aren't the only two options, but just for the sake of looking at just this question. And if I can help someone look down the road and say, if naturalism, then what? If theism, then what? Um, if I can really press that down the road a ways, we're going to get to points where we see how stark those differences are. Naturalism, you look down the road with naturalism, and basically you just live long enough, you wait long enough, and nothing Every, everyone is dead and every consequence of what we did has ceased to matter because everyone else is dead too. Um, the, the universe is winding down. There's nothing that is going to last forever. And think, if you think about what that means for love, if you think about what that means for justice, if you think about what that means for meaning, if you think about what that means for that transcendent feeling of longing that comes over you in the final few minutes of your favorite movie when the soundtrack is playing, and, it, and the world is coming back together at the end of a movie. Um, why do we have those feelings? Why do we have those longings? Well, on a natural, if you look down the road with naturalism, that's all just our evolutionary backstory. There is nothing, no transcendent referent for that. That is so dark when you think about it. So if I can help someone think about that, if I can help them see the implications of going down that path versus going down this path, and, and then in the other direction, if you think of if Jesus really did rise from the dead, I talk about this in the book, that think about what that means. That means that every good, happy experience you've ever had, if you're in Christ and, and you will be raised with him, if you're a Christian, 
all of that, that every good thing you've ever known is just a foretaste. Every happy moment of your life is just a tiniest little taste of what is to come. Um, it means that every sad thing that has ever happened will somehow be unmade and turned into glory for those who are in Christ. If I can help people start to imagine that, if I can help that start to penetrate the armor of indifference, and get into their heart and think, wow, um, the difference is literally infinite between these two alternatives. It is literally a matter of infinite relief versus infinite despair. It, it really is. And so that's what I'm trying to do in this book is to help people care about the answer by drawing attention to the, the, uh, the implications and how much of a more beautiful story one of these options is than the other. Excuse me. Yeah. That, and that brings it back around to, to Pascal in some ways, like one of his major themes is, is cutting through apathy. He, he, he'll say, you spend all these all this time doing these things that don't really amount to anything, but no time considering these things of ultimate importance. Mm -hmm. And and he kind of seems like he he builds uh, his famous Pascal's wager um, as, as a result of that. And and the way the way Pascal's wager had always been explained to me, it seemed like it seemed like kind of a cheap argument. Like if you buy into Christianity. And you're wrong, you haven't really lost anything. But if you buy into atheism and you're wrong, you've lost everything. And, it, it, and it's, it's always seemed like a cheap argument. And, and you argue in your book that it's, it's really not. And, and as I, I, I went and um, after I read your book, I read uh, Pascal's Ponce. And, and I think you're right. I mean, there, there's so much more nuance to, to what he's saying. Um, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with just at least give it a chance. I mean, that this is this is something of uh, he he frames in a, in the in the form of a wager, but he to me it was almost like he was saying like at least give the the arguments a chance because this is something of yeah like like what you're describing infinite importance versus not really much of anything at all um, right. Yeah. And, and, and one thing that helps with Pascal's wager to understand as well is that he's addressing that specifically to people who are undecided. They're 50-50. So he's not using that as like this argument works in every context. And there's many other points of nuance too that I, I think Pascal's wager actually makes a lot of sense. If for no other reason, it draws attention to the stakes of yeah. the issue. And that's again, what I'm trying to do in my book. I end the whole book almost, my third to last paragraph, with another entry from Pascal's Ponce, where this is a briefer entry, you know, for people watching this, his Ponce were unpublished, incomplete thoughts that people found at his desk. So a lot of them are like just a, a random sentence, you know, uh, but it, these pithy, interesting thoughts that are different than anything else I've ever read. One of his briefer ones simply reads this, thus, quote, an heir finds the deeds to his house. Will he say, perhaps that they are false and not bother to examine them, end quote. That's it. And, uh, the, you know, what he's trying to be, it's like, in other words, if you get a, a, a winning, a lottery ticket and you're told that it, it's a winner, are you going to say, well, it, it might be wrong, so I'm not going to investigate it? Of course not. You know, it's the, <laughs> winning the lottery. It's like, it's at least worth checking it out, right? Yeah. And that's kind of the effect of Pascal. He's trying to say, look, this is, infinitely important so it's worth investigation it's worth all your yearning all your hoping all your investigation and i say things a lot of things like that in the book too yeah that was uh, on pascal like when i started reading it i i wasn't quite sure what i was getting into and i, I was all these disconnected thoughts and i, I was just like it, but but the more i got into it the more you just really see the genius of uh the, the book he would have made, you know, this is kind of an unfinished, uh, unfinished book of apologetics, but, um, but yeah, man, what a, what a thinker. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about your, your fourth chapter where you do get into the, um, the distinctively Christian uh, arguments for God. You, um, you mentioned uh, C.S. Lewis and how he posits his, uh, his, fa his famous, um, three options for understanding who Jesus is. You can, uh, you can believe that he's Lord. You can consider him a liar 
or else he's a lunatic. And that, that Lord Liar lunatic threesome, you, you suggest that there ought to be a fourth uh, option there if we're, um, if we're being thorough and that's that, that Jesus was a legend, that, um, that maybe he didn't make all these claims about himself that were later attributed to him that we find in, um, in the gospels. Um, and, and you even say you, you, you weren't sure at first whether a, uh, a strong case could be built that the gospels were historically reliable, but, um, but you, based on the evidence changed your mind, talk, talk a little bit about that. Like how, um, how solid is that evidence that the Jesus that's presented in the gospels, um, the, the events of, of his, his death and resurrection, that those were faithfully recorded and that we can trust those. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And this is, uh, one of the problems with the traditional trilemma that C.S. Lewis gives in the New York Christianity is it does assume that Jesus actually made the claim to be God. And so a lot of what I'm going through in chapter four is Bart Ehrman and his claim that basically, well, Jesus was a religious figure, but he didn't claim to be God. Um, that's That came up about 20 years after he died. That's Bart Ehrman's argument. Um, so I, it's like we do have to engage that as another possibility, uh, hence the Lord, liar, lunatic, or legend. Um, and yeah, this is another one of those areas where I thought, you know, I bet it can be plausible to believe in Christ based upon just the historical evidence. But I didn't think it'd be like a real strong argument. And I was impressed by how strong the argument is on historical grounds for the Lord alternative over and against liar, lunatic, or legend. Um, there, you know, how to get at this, um, could put it like this, when we look, here's a metaphor, if, if you're just meeting someone for the first time, there's various things that after five minutes of talking to them, you'll probably have an initial impression of whether you regard them as basically a trustworthy person, uh, though you won't know for sure, it's just been five minutes, or there could be things that they say, they could say some things that are kind of off-putting in the first five minutes that you say, boy, I don't know if I can take this person at their word, you know. Um, There's certain qualities that can make you trust someone. If someone uh, is trust, trusted by others, for example, if someone says consistent things, if someone says, admits something embarrassing, you know, there's things like that that can tend to be endearing. They tend to endear your trust. When I look at the Gospels, I find them so endearing. Um, you think about First of all, the, all the embarrassing details. I mean, just the fact that everybody looks like an idiot, <laughs> except for Jesus. They all paint themselves out as these faithless, bumbling along, never understanding, you know, until you get to the book of Acts. Okay, but they didn't write the book of Acts. Uh, so the gospel accounts, what would be the motive for that? Then you've got all these different people. There's 16. There's actually more than 16 eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection named by name in the New Testament. So you've got to say, okay, so they're all not only, they're all consistent. Nobody breaks. If, for example, if it was a lie, if the resurrection of Christ was not true and they made it up, that's one of the alternatives. Nobody broke. That is astonishing. Under torture, nobody broke. Um, just the sheer historical quality, they're so detailed compared to the later Gnostic Gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are filled with highly specific historical geographical detail. There's Pontius Pilate, there's the Sea of Galilee, there's the census that took place in Luke 2, you know, there's all these things. They were written pretty soon after. It'd be like if somebody wrote a history of the Great Depression in the 1970s or something like that. If it's filled with errors, in the highly specific details it's giving, people would still be alive who could remember that. These documents, even by the most, the later dates, wouldn't be that much further than that. Everyone admits they're within, compare that to other historical figures, like Alexander the Great or other people like that. We have biographies that are way after the fact for. So the, the, there's so much to this, but the big picture is the historical details we have concerning the basic idea that Jesus claimed to be God are pretty good. Um, I go through Bart Ehrman's argument, and I look at all the different passages that he even he would grant, go back to the historical Jesus. 
And in a lot of these, there's claims that Jesus makes that I don't think we can make sense of if he's a less than divine figure. When he claims to forgive sins, for example, in Mark 2, Bart Ehrman says, oh, this is just, he's just announcing that this person's sins are forgiven by God. But that's not the whole, the whole point of the narrative is um, so that you may know uh, that even the, the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. The whole point and the reason the Pharisees are uh, accusing Jesus of blasphemy is they know what he's claiming, um, and, and he, he's acting with divine authority. That's a consistent uh, characteristic of how Christ functions in the Gospels. So um, just the, uh, yeah, so the, the New Testament documents, I mean, put it like this, we've all got to make some sense of Jesus. Everybody's got to have some interpretation. He's the most famous person in all of history, the largest religion and the most diverse religion, put it even broader. He's the, he has the most adherence of yeah. any other human being. More people adhere to his philosophy than anyone else. So you got to have some way to explain that, you know? And the fact is, um, all the other explanations, other than the fact that he really was who he claimed to be, they're, they're not easy. The liar, the, the legend, and the lunatic, none of those are easy options. And I don't see a fourth option other than Lord. So I actually think that argument is on the table. I actually think that argument is, is pretty compelling. Um, I was surprised by how compelling it was as I did my research. That's really good. Thanks, Gavin. Is there, um, is there anything else we, that we didn't talk about uh, that you want to, to leave us with this evening? Well, uh, a couple of the things I could mention that, that could be useful for people as they're picking up the book. I also have an argument from music. Any musicians out there watching this may be interested to uh, go to that one. And that was a lot of fun to write as well. Again, it's an abductive argument. That means an inference to the best explanation. Um, I also have an argument from love where I talk about Olaf in Frozen 2 <laughs> because um, I have a six-year-old daughter and I have to confess that I've seen the movie Frozen 2 many times. Uh, and I have to confess too, I love the music from Frozen 2, but there's one song where um, there kind of explores themes of transience versus permanence. And then there's a scene where Olaf says, I just thought of something that is permanent. And uh, I can't remember it's Anna. For all of have seen the movie, I can't remember if it's Anna or Elsa. The other character says, what's that? And he says, love. And that gets me into the argument from love, which is another fascinating appeal to make is, is that true that love is permanent? And this is another one of those things where you look down the road of a naturalistic worldview versus a theistic worldview, you come up with very different interpretations of love. In a naturalistic worldview, love is in, as I would see things, it's sort of stripped of its nobility and its dignity, and its elegance, and it's um, explained reductively by evolutionary mechanisms. And uh, that's another bitter pill to swallow. Again, it's like seeing, looking down the road of naturalism is really useful to do. So I, there's, so people, there's an argument for everybody in here, I hope. I mean, uh, you know, I hope people could find this useful in those ways. And uh, I, I also, one last thing I'll say is, it's, it's coming from my heart. The first sentence of the book is, this book is written from my heart more than anything else I've ever written. It really is. I include journal entries, multiple journal entries from my college days where I was wrestling through questions related to the content. Um, and I kind of talk the reader through at times, kind of here's how I've wrestled with this here, you know, so hopefully it's, it's slightly on the academic side as a book, but I do believe it could be accessible for people. And especially if they skip around, maybe skip the first chapter on the argument for God as the first cause, because that one gets pretty technical when you're talking about the big bang. But um, other than that, I think it hopefully could be the kind of thing people could really find accessible. So I hope it will be helpful for people. I hope it will help us in the moment that we're in right now, point people to hope and point people to God. I think it will, Gavin. Yeah, I, I loved the book. I thought it was, uh, like you're saying, it was it can get technical, but not over the head of, uh, of most people who are going to pick this up. So uh, I think this is going to be a really, uh, really helpful book. Again, uh, there are links in the chat if you do want to order the book uh, for 40% off and, uh, and free freight. Um, if you follow the link, uh, that'll take you right to uh, the buy page. 
Um, Gavin, thank you so much for being with us tonight and uh, chatting with us. Uh, it was a great discussion and we were uh, really blessed to have you. My pleasure. Thanks for doing this, Christopher, and thanks everybody for being here and watching. Uh, thanks, brother.